<laughs> got that one going. Kyle, welcome to the show. Happy to have you on the podcast. Thanks, Rich. It's good to be here. This one's been a long time coming. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've 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 tried on multiple occasions, and it's just uh, I've always been maybe a little nervous to come on. I've been nervous to have you on. <laughs> You've been so many different kinds of person to me. It sounds weird to say that, but I think I first met you in early 2009, and that was a different Kyle from, say, 2012, which was different from 2015. Fast forward all the way to today, 2021 is about to end, and yeah. now you're this. So uh, let's just jump right in. Are you ready? Let's do it. All right. When did you get to Nosara? Uh, first time I came to Nosara was back in 97. Um, it was on basically a scouting trip with my dad and my three brothers. Uh, we were trying to find out where the next home was going to be. Uh, we traveled up the coast, came to Nosara, and everybody was just unanimous. It was, this is the spot. As soon as we saw Guiones Beach, it was, it was, you know, love at first sight. Just like that. Yeah. We stayed at the Harmony Hotel. It was like my first time ever surfing. We went down to Guiones and it was just, there's one guy out in the water and it was like, Dad, this is the spot. Don't look anywhere else. So was it Via Taipei then or was it something even before nope. that? It was Via Taipei owned by Peter and Gabriella. Shout out to them. That was the first place I stayed when I visited too. Yeah, it was, it was, I think one of the nicer spots here, especially at the time, close to the beach. They had a good setup, huge pool. It was very hot though. We actually spent most of our time at Casa Tucan. They had a really nice, cool pool. Oh yeah, I forgot about Tucan. Good burgers. Jeez. Man, we're going back in time here. All right. So when did you move here full time and tell us your history? Like give us a 30,000 foot overview of your childhood and growing up here. Well, okay, so we originally came from Catalina Island, California, um, moved here in 98 to start a little boutique hotel, um, which over the years grew. Um, after about our second year here, we were brought our first injured uh, orphan wild animal. We brought a, a baby monkey that we kind of rescued, uh, started taking care of. It was brought to you at the Harbor Reef. Would you clarify the name? Of the at the Harbor Reef. Yeah, at the Harbor Reef. Um, so they brought us this baby monkey to see if we could like help take care of it. And then that grew into another one and then another one. And then it was baby pisotes and raccoons and toucans and like all of the different things you could imagine. And so... So the, the wildlife refuge started organically like that. It was you guys started a hotel, then injured animals were brought in and your yeah. mom... I guess might seem to like animals a little bit. We were always raising baby animals on the island. Uh, we always had, you know, baby goats, pigs, deer, like all the stuff you could think of, bottle feeding it. And it was just, I think, part of the family and especially my mom. Uh, and then here they brought us the first baby monkey whose mom had been electrocuted by the power line. So a friend of mine found it on the ground, brought it to us. Uh, we nursed it back to health. And that was kind of the birth of the refuge. Wow. It was it happened in, I think, 99 or early 2000, like right right in there. So you're still a kid here. No, I was 11. All right. So you went to school here? Like there's a lot of schools here and there's a big education theme with Nosara at this point, but that's kind of new. What was it like back then? So back then, none of these private schools existed around here. Uh, we had the public schools. So my first uh, bit of school here was in the Escuelita Nosara for a small time. Um, got my sixth grade uh, degree and then moved to the high school, which was a, a really fun experience, to be honest. Uh, getting to know all the local kids, learning Spanish better. Um, and then also, like, even down to the ways, like, when you got in trouble... It wasn't kind of go sit at your desk the whole time. It was like, here's a machete and go chop the soccer field, you know? So it was, it was, it was interesting. So you'd say you have a different, a different kind of educational experience. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but I thought it was a good education and I'm really grateful for it. All right. So again, it's the end of 2021, just a couple of days left as we record this. You're still in Osara, a same place, but a lot of stuff changed. Like, bring us up to speed. How do you see this place now? Nosara's evolved. It's changed. It's grown. I mean, I don't think any of us thought it was going to go so big so fast, even though it's been 24, 25 years, so maybe not super fast. But uh, this, the secret's out, you know. Uh, it's become a place where instead of just coming to vacation, people want to live. They want to raise their kids here. <laughs> 
Um, oh, man, there's a paved road out there. There's doctor's offices. There's multiple private schools and public schools. Yep. There's so much happening here. And now even Ticos are coming. Like yeah. when I first started, yeah. got here, very few Ticos came out to Nosar, at least from the Central Valley as much. Then yep. it seemed like somewhere around 2011, 12, 13, somewhere in there. You know what it was? I bet it was when the Harmony they what was it they hired Cayuga brought a bunch of people out yep. and I remember a lot of those people the cookies the Marahus yep. uh the Gerardos yep. like those people have all went on to do amazing things Marahus president Absolutely. of the security association cookie is president of the civic association Gerardo Liz Guiones, like those are just a couple names and, and and actually really strong and influential people in this community like they've all come and done great things I mean cookie was the president of the NCA who who has helped this community in ways that most people wouldn't even understand. All right. So let's pause you there. Cause you work in real estate now, which is almost comical because when <laughs> I met you, you were like anti real estate, you were in hospitality, but real estate was kind of like, yeah, I don't know about that stuff. Uh, but now you work in it. Talk us through how you could go from growing up with monkeys, literally sharing your bedroom <laughs> and all kinds of animals and being part of the refuge. But now you also work in real estate, which again, the people around here, when you say real estate, people get a weird look on their face. So you're inside the belly of the beast, man. So, uh, yeah. Why are you doing that? What's that all about? Well, I mean, shoot. I mean, it's real estate's, I feel like a double edged sword. How so? Um, on the fact that people are coming regardless. The, I mean, it's the, the properties are going to be sold. People own them. They, they're already invested. It, it's happening. So instead of sitting on the side and kind of complaining about everything I see happening, I'd rather be on the front line and trying to educate people, uh, you know, hopefully showing them the value in the trees that are on the property instead of just, oh, you can build this massive house here. It's we have amazing architects and really good, capable builders that can build around trees and can incorporate them if, if you ask. Are you starting to see that happen? Because a lot of people, again, who live here, very well intended and want the place to remain cool and the nature and the wildlife is a big part of that. And obviously stuff's happening. Your family's refuge is growing and expanding and can't keep up with all the displacement and injured animals. So there's a lot of bad. So on the real estate side, people are coming and there ain't nothing you can do about it. You're right. So how are you blending those two? Again, it's, 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 it's all I think through education, you know, people are coming down from New York or from San Francisco or Texas or whatever, and they don't know what tree this is. They don't know what value it adds to the wildlife or, or the surroundings or what it's doing to the soil. Tell us some of the key uh, things that people should know in your opinion that, that they should know about before they buy property or do something here. Well, I mean, maybe go sit on the property first and see if there's, wildlife paths you'll you'll see certain trees that attract the monkeys and are, are paths through maybe try to situate your house put your house in a position that it doesn't have to remove those trees you know i mean obviously some trees sometimes are going to have to go to be able to put your house there but we can be conscious and considerate about it and we can also replace uh, trees that had to be taken out with trees that are going to give a big impact to the, the, the wildlife. You know, it's sometimes these ornamental bushes and cactus and stuff like that do absolutely nothing. You know, so uh, again, it's you talk to Gerardo Bolaños. He knows which trees are going to do some of the biggest impacts. I mean, you see the, Disforest, deforestation around here. Um, but at the same time, we've got to remember that Guiones in particular, as you see down south, was cattle fields. So we're actually in somewhat of a regenerative community already. Um, and we have some really special factors like the, the 240 uh, hectares of, of preserve that we have in the area, the the 200 meters setback from the beach for the Oceanal Wildlife Refuge. That I mean, I have friends that were on the front row where where Casa Romantica and 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 those places are, and you could see the surf from those houses. It was literally grass. And now, thanks to Costas Verdes and and the community, look at the the jungle that's growing. You know, so things like that are what encourage me and. For a little bit in, in the real estate world, because of prices and stuff like that, I was, I was kind of afraid that, that the, the original concept of here of, of creating green spaces and, and community around them was going to be too expensive to recreate. 
But now I see this wave of investors and people that are coming in here and, you know, like Bart with his project in Cantada, 300 acres, 60% of it is becoming a regenerative, regenerated forest. You know, he's taking cattle field, uh, allowing people to, to buy into it. And 60% of it is set aside for preserve. It's wonderful. And, and that is some of the things that excite me. And those are the projects that I want to be behind and I want to support. And I want to show people that there's huge value in doing those kinds of things. So you have hope. Oh, you, I mean, I, th I think you, you kind of got to, you, you, uh, you got to be optimistic. You got to hope for, for a bright future. And, and I think Nosara, I've always said Nosara revolves around five pillars, which is surfing, yoga, nature, health, and family. And I think as long as the people that continue to come here value those pillars, we're going to go in a good direction. Man, it's interesting to hear you say that because you and your family see the toughest of the tough. I mean, well, shoot, you see my brother in the, in the fire department or my, my mom with the refuge. Uh, I mean, yeah, we, we see all sorts of like we, we see in a different depth of what's going on here. But. Like my mom, she started years ago with, uh, with the refuge and one of her first things was to get the electrical company to change like 47 kilometers of power lines to an insulated line. Now we're working with homeowners to, to put, uh, these, these rubber boots over the, the, the transformer connectors to protect animals even further. Um, and, and since that's happened, I mean, yes, we still receive animals from here, but the refuge has actually grown to a point that we're now receiving animals from all of Guanacaste. It's not just Nosara. Uh, we work closely with Manai, and our focus is rescue, rehabilitation, and release, is to get the animals in, get them healthy, and back into the wild as quickly as possible. And, um, you know, they've had a lot of really good success. I, I, I definitely think that, uh, you know, it's been a very impactful project here. And now yeah. to see it uh, adopted by IAR, which is an international organization that focuses on this, is really encouraging because it, it's it's kind of like that next step and allowing my my mom and dad maybe to kind of step back and finally <laughs> retire, and and it to live on. So it's 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 very exciting. I'm hopeful to see the the next phases of that. Wow! So you're actually hopeful that the people coming in will help save the place. And you're reporting back that it actually is sort of happening right now with your family's existence because for so many years you guys have been on it, man. Remember when we had to sell your hotel? Remember when we had to do like X, Y, Z? Like you guys have been pegged, like your RPM level so high for so long. And if you're telling me that it's actually like gaining well, momentum and your family can enjoy their retirement at some point in time, that's so good to hear. It'd be amazing. They've, they've earned it. Um, what do you want people to know about that? Like, it's just, uh, what's something, because a lot of people just think there's a refuge. Oh, I can pet a monkey. Cool. Yeah, definitely they, not. It's De not like that. Definitely not. Um, uh, you know, I mean, in the, in the original years, we were still kind of learning and that's where, you know, the monkeys actually like, I shared a bedroom with monkeys, you know, and I still hear people like, I want a monkey. You definitely don't want a monkey. I swear to you, I've lived with them. You don't want a monkey. <laughs> If I could leave one thing on this podcast, like, like explicitly clear, you don't want a monkey. <laughs> They're great in the trees. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's cool to see. And, and now seeing the community kind of joining on, um, they're going to be relocating the refuge finally out of basically my parents' home, which is where it started and has been for so many years. Uh, to an official location, which uh, I'm, I'm not going to get too deep into that. I'm sure that'll be something else. And another... don't jinx it, man. Uh, I don't definitely don't want to, but it looks like we're close uh, right now. It's okay. from the sound of it. We're just waiting for water letters, which will be amazing. What do you hear about water? Like in your daily life, what are the questions people ask you? And what are some of the thoughts that you have yourself? Well, I mean, I understand why the government did what they did. Guanacaste is one of the driest regions. And it's also had some of the most growth over the last few years. So the government requesting that we verify that we have the capacity of water for future growth, I think is necessary. I mean, water's life. So we need to take care of it and we need to, to, to use it responsibly. Um, I would say to, to people, and I see a lot of new homes, and this is something I always try to, to tell my people is wait till May to do your planting. 
May is usually when we get the first few rains out of the year. So the, the plants get a little bit, I mean, rainwater is going to be better than ground, like, like hose water, a thousandfold. You know, it's just, it's got, I don't know, more nutrients. It just, I feel like it does more for the plants. Um, and maybe there's scientists that'll correct me on that, but, but that's just kind of how I feel. I see it in my garden. Um, so plant in May and then you can assist it a little bit through, through like June and July, but then August comes and they're already somewhat settled. So it can run through the rainy season. And by the next summer, the plants are pretty much, uh, established, you know, a little assistance, but I think that's the best way to, have nice gardens and plant and really have the, the best water usage. And just follow the seasons. Yeah, follow the seasons. That makes sense. So, Kyle, you're in a unique spot because you've lived here since you were 10. You've seen this place when it was just a couple of expats uh, compared to now where it's now popular. Your family started a refuge. You've literally lived with monkeys in your house, in your room. But at the same time, now you work in real estate and, and you've worked in, I guess, tourism the whole time through the family hotel. So... Yeah. You just touched a lot of different areas of the spot. It's a very dynamic existence. So what is this place to you as we enter 2022? What is this place to you right now? What are you seeing as far as the people that are here, the type of people who are coming in? What's your read on it? Well, as you said earlier, I'm, I'm hopeful. But at the same time, there's a little bit of a fear factor because we are getting a wave of new people that are coming into the community. And um, not everybody has the same mindset. You do see people that are, are, are looking at it more from an economical standpoint. All right. So, Kyle, again, you have a very unique perspective. You're very pro wildlife space, bigger lots, lower density, all the things that everyone says. But the reality is people are moving here. The lot sizes have gotten smaller. Not everyone can adhere to the standards that you're such a fan of. We had the building regulations, which kind of came in, went out. Uh, uh, walk us through your opinion on, on all of that. Well, shoot. Uh, when, when I first saw the regulations being passed, um, I was I was actually for them. You know, I was definitely pro regulations. I think that we needed some sort of limitation on on the overall construction that was happening here. But all at the same time, I understand that there was some things that prop weren't properly done. Um, right, but the point is you're for the regulations and you like what, what the goal was. Yeah. I actually hope we can get back to some sort of a regulation, but I'd like it to be, you know, properly, properly written. There, there were some complications in the way the, the regulations were worded that really did limit people's rights. And, and, and as much, and, but at the same time, I felt like for the greater good, it was worth it. I got you. Now, most of your friends are Tico's. You grew up here, like with, they're your family now. Of course. How did the Tika populace view it all? I, you know what? Like, I, I think the Tico populace was somewhat misinformed based on certain agendas. Um, I don't think it impacted them as, as negatively as they might have been let to believe in certain circumstances. Um, you know, the, the biggest one I saw in there was probably the upgraded septic systems. And I think that's something that we should implement immediately. I mean, we're talking about our groundwater. You know, we should have good septic systems because we don't have a sewage, uh, you know, treatment plant. sewage treatment plant for the community. And it is on an individual basis. And, you know, we need to take care of our groundwater. Vanessa and Robert Edgeworth got the WCA started and started studying the water. And we started doing podcasts about it and the information's grown. It's interesting to see more homeowners are being proactive than we've ever seen before. So that's kind of hopeful. That's a good sign. I mean, that's, I think the vast majority that Nosara, the people that are coming here, I think care about the place. And I know there's some that aren't so fan of it or maybe have different um, agendas, but I still think the majority of people that are coming here is because they, they appreciate the place and they want to do the right thing. That takes me back to part of why I am a realtor is I want to be, I'm one of their first connections here and I want to be that education to them, you know, that tells them, yes, you know what, you should spend the extra money and put in a good, a good sewage treatment plant or, or biodigester system. It's important. Um, even though the law says that you can build 75%, doesn't mean you have to maybe stick to 50. That is kind of like the, the rule of thumb here and what the vast majority of the community would be grateful for. 
So I, I can't obligate or tell people what they have to do, but I can educate them on what the community feels in the majority and, and hope that they do it. All right. So what's your predictions for the future? Let's step beyond the present day. Walk me through the next five or 10 years here. Wow. That's, that's a difficult one. Um, I feel that we're kind of at a turning point during COVID. Everything kind of changed here. The whole dynamic of the community where, where Nosara I felt for years was much more of a tourism based community. I feel like now it's more of a, of a community. Like people live here. Um, it's, it's not all tourists. So, so the people that are here, I think, they care a little bit more about their surroundings because it's not just the vacation home that they own down in Costa Rica. You know, this is for a lot of people where they're raising their kids now, you know, with Del Mar and the Mon- uh, and, uh, Waldorf school and, and then Ellie Mar and all these different things. Um, it's allowed a lot of young families to be here. And I think that is great for the place because parents care, you know, and, and I think that's going to be a really interesting, uh, dynamic for the, for the community for the next, few years growing seems to me like schools are what changed the Malpais, Santa Teresa, Nosara. They were both kind of pacing the same. It seemed like for a long time. And then after Nosara went more family, yep. more health oriented, more go to sleep earlier, wake up earlier, healthier type of family, familial lifestyle. And it seems like Malpais, Santa Teresa turned into more fun. If you want to party or rage or jam, you know what? I, I, I love going down to Santa Tere. Like, uh, it's, it's a fun place. You can go down, good surf, a lot of different restaurants, a really fun young vibe. But, you know, I love coming back here to home. This is, this is where I want my roots. And then from here, I can travel anywhere in the world. And I think every time you travel, you're a little bit more grateful when you come home. Speaking of elsewhere in the world, you and I used to spend time chasing waves up in Nicaragua. Yep. Talk me through that a little bit. Well, I mean, Shoot, when, when we sold the hotel, I guess I was looking for, you know, the, the next Nosara where, where this place used to be. As, as more people come, you get more regulations, you get more, uh, more density, more, 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 more people in the water, just more everything. That's the best way to say it. And I felt that northern Nicaragua, where, where kind of we went just past everything, was still maybe one of the last pieces of the Wild West. And, and, you know, for, for, for me and, and from where I've come from, that's something that's definitely very, uh, appealing. Um, but then also you, you look at the, the, the political situation and, and then, uh, just in, just in general, I, I think Nicaragua is going to have its moment and I'm, 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 I'm happy to have my little pieces up there. But, uh, this is the now and this is where I really want to be. This is if I was, I don't have kids, but if I did, this is where I would want to raise them. So how do you spend your days, uh, outside of real estate and actually I don't want to say anything. So how do you spend your days? What do you do to amuse yourself? Well, uh, unfortunately I'm not surfing as much as I used to. Uh, you knew I was going there. I'm trying to mess with you because you need to surf more. I do need to surf more. Um, a few years ago. I kind of like finished my house and I started focusing my attention to my garden and I I love my plants. I love my trees. And so in the morning, especially in the summertime, it's dry. You've got to water them to really help them through and, and not all of them, but certain plants need help, especially if I just planted them. So most days I wake up, make a fresh pot of coffee at like six in the morning and I go water my plants while it's still kind of cool out. Tell us about your fish pond. (laughs) Well, so, when COVID hit, um, I kind of stepped back, stayed at home, and uh, just did projects that I'd always kind of wanted to do. Um, I built a chicken coop. I built a tilapia pond, um, a little greenhouse. And I mean, the tilapia pond is, is probably one of my, uh, my, my, my fun moments. Like, I, I love going down there and sitting with my coffee, and I've got this little bamboo pole with a, with a bobber, and I can catch tilapia and just hang out and mess around or my nephews come over and uh catch and release but um but yeah it's it's pretty fun when covid was happening i guess it's before i hit my head i used to sit and think while we were all locked up i was like Kyle's somewhere happy right now <laughs> i'm really happy for you that you're having success and i hope that nosara stays as comfortable as you want it to be yeah, thank you. Me, me too. I, I really, I really hope for the best possible future. 
You know, I, I think Nosara has so much potential and I think we have an opportunity here to really make something special. And, uh, I mean, that's why I want to be involved in it. That's why I'm here and, and, you know, I don't know, it's going to be exciting. Thanks for coming in, sir. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for having me.